Well, welcome to the Libertarian Alliance. We meet uh, every third uh, Tuesday of the month. Uh, tonight I speak with Jan Lester, and the topic is uh, Libertarianism and Immigrationism. Uh, immigration and Libertarianism, speak your pardon. Open borders versus directionalism. Just like to say that anybody who's turned up tonight in this weather is a fanatic and an extremist, and I hope that the government has got you on their list. <laughs> People who needs to be watched. <laughs> Introduction. There has long been a debate in the libertarian literature as to the correct policy on immigration. This talk primarily compares directionally libertarian policies with, op with the open borders option. Two, working backwards from an imagined solution. Imagine that the UK has become a rapidly developing minimal state libertarian country. This includes the airports, ports and all of the roads being privately owned, maintained, operated and policed. Some roads have fairly undiscriminating access, especially where they have retail outlets that want to attract custom. Many roads are gated and guarded because the owners don't want the nuisance or security risk of people coming in uninvited. Thoroughfares have been negotiated or court imposed on libertarian theory principles to ensure uh, access around the country. Many people around the world want to move to libertarian UK. Some of these people are invited to come to specific places in order to work. Other people meet the residency requirements to move into certain areas and some come in as sponsored guests or tourists with personal or business guarantors that are liable for any necessary security costs or fines if leave dates are exceeded. There is a wide variety of similar options. However, there are many more people who would like to move to Libertarian UK, but they haven't been invited. Consequently, there are private barriers and security measures to stop them. These are at airports, ports, along the coast, and as elaborate as seems desirable. A relatively small number of people do still manage to sneak in by some means. But it's not worth increasing airport and border security beyond a certain point. In any case, even after gaining entry, those people find that they cannot uh, simply choose to go or live just anywhere because there are private gates, barriers and security systems across the entire country. So they either tend to be caught eventually and fined or put to, into, to work in prison to pay the fine before being expelled or they manage to become unobtrusive, productive member, members of the areas that allow them in. Peace, security and ever-increasing abundance pervade the land. This is a model society, if not yet an anarchy, that the rest of the world can observe and, if they wish, emulate. Then something unforeseen happens. The government decides to compulsorily purchase all of the roads, ports, airports and coastal security in order, says the Prime Minister, to hold and maintain them in trust for the citizenry. That's a direct quotation. He assures us that the very modest initial increase in overall taxation, currently at around 5% of gross national product, is all that is needed to cover their upkeep and operation at current standards. He confidently predicts that there will soon be economies of scale due to having sole 
public ownership, that is, a state monopoly. Hence, we will all be better off, eventually. Many people have their doubts that the free market has missed such an alleged economies of scale, uh, but it doesn't seem worth most people's while to uh, uh, complain or campaign against it, and they think that just maybe they will save some money eventually. After a few years, the additional overall taxation has risen, and that still doesn't appear to be enough. Quelle surprise, as the French would say, if only they had English accents. <laughs> Rather than try to raise taxes further, the Prime Minister announces that in the interests of economy and the free movement of UK residents, he will be removing all of the UK roads, internal gates, barriers and relevant policing. Many people are unhappy about this. Some of them observe that similar arguments could be used to remove people's front doors so that anyone might enter their homes. There is a significant increase in various crimes now that no UK resident can be denied access to any street in the country. With the mysterious exception of Downing Street, which remains gated and policed. <laughs> After a few more years, the Prime Minister announces that in the interests of economy and freedom of migration, he is removing all border security around the country and its ports and airports. In the ensuing months, many millions of people from around the world flood into libertarian UK. According to Gallup data, about 45 million people would come to the UK as a first choice now. Presumably that number would increase significantly were the UK even richer, thanks to being libertarian, of course, and the only desirable country with an open border. As economics implies, and I think this is the fundamental argument, people keep on arriving up to the point that the UK is no better, all things considered, the rain, cost of travel, what, what have you, than the places from whence they come. And many of those places are awful. The President of the United States used a somewhat different epithet to describe <laughs> But I will not distress you gentle folk by repetition of that. Or Patrick. <laughs> All of the country's parks and squares have become shanty towns. All kinds of crime are rife and increasing, far exceeding any problems that we have actually seen in Germany and Sweden, for instance, with relatively tiny recent immigration increases. Many native people have left and more are preparing to leave. Someone shot dead the Prime Minister and the remaining native population celebrated but there is no going back. <coughs> what are we to make of this thought exp experiment from a libertarian viewpoint? Everything the imagined government has done has been a move away from a libertarian society. This appears to suggest that the full libertarian policy now in our real not so bad situation should be due to do the reverse of this thought experiment and privatise everything among the existing population. But clearly that is not yet politically possible. Currently all the roads, migration controls etc are in effect held in trust and maintained and operated at taxpayer expense by the state 
on behalf of the existing population. Or, at least, that is the only reasonable excuse the state could offer for its monopoly of these things. And as opinion polls consistently show, the overwhelming majority of the existing population want controlled immigration. So on no libertarian account should the state do the very opposite of this and open the borders. It's hard to see how allowing the country to fall to third world standards as opening the borders would ine inevitably eventually cause could have good long run consequences even for the most, most of the new immigrants or the rest of the world. This is especially so because there is the very obvious libertarian alternative of practicing full free trade with the poor regions of the world and thereby raising their living standards to something that would relatively soon approach that of wealthier countries and maybe even exceed it if they were themselves to become more libertarian than we currently are which is not a very high bar to reach. All of this might seem fairly obvious to most libertarians. However, some libertarian texts argue that the state should have open borders, no immigration restrictions for libertarian and humanitarian reasons. A variety of criticisms of open borders are dealt with in these texts and many of the given answers are to varying degrees adequate. However, they don't deal with the disaster scenario outlined here. A few conclusions from some of these texts will now be criticized. Three, responses from some open border advocacies. Lock. 1998. Either it, migration is totally legitimate, in which case there should be no interferences with it whatsoever, or it is a violation of the non-aggression axiom, in which case it should be banned fully. I have argued in this paper that the former position is the only correct one. Immigration, in particular, is neither totally legitimate in libertarian terms, nor totally a violation. In a fully libertarian society, there would be no state borders, and so no over, overall immigration control as such. There would only be private owner control of entry. But when we have the state owning the roads, etc., supposedly on behalf of the existing population, as we currently do, then a compromise is all that is possible in practice. And given the utter disaster for the existing population of open borders, and uh, having some restrictions on immigration is more libertarian, however imperfect this is compared to a fully libertarian ideal. Block and Callahan, 2003. The profit motive, if nothing else, would lead to the mass invitation of foreigners to our shores. Mass invitation of foreigners into private property is not the problem. The problem is a devastating deluge of uninvited foreigners coming into territory held in trust for the existing population. Hoppy maintains that in the present context, the US government is in effect a manager for the private property owners who live within the borders of the country. We maintain, in contrast, that the state cannot properly take on any such role. Just because Hoppy says it, it isn't necessarily false. <laughs> Correct. It cannot do it properly, i.e. efficiently and according to libertarian principles. 
but it can do a better job or a worse job. And allowing unlimited immigration is close to doing the worst possible job. State speaks in this regard, and this is a quotation within a crochet a quotation, if the state cannot legitimately create borders in the first place because its very existence is illegitimate, then it manifestly cannot promulgate just rules with regard to how open or closed any such borders will be. Correct. The state cannot provide fully just rules. But open borders are even more unjust than restrictions that prevent a libertarian and welfare disaster. Gregory and Block, 2007. Because of the socialist economic calculation problem, there is no way for government immigration controls to keep out the uninvited, let in the invited, or even determine who would fall into each category. The state simply cannot mimic the market and directing its coercive mechanism in such an attempt will prove ineffective in achieving desired goals, wasteful of wealth created in the private sector and destructive of liberty. All completely true, but it misses the big picture, which is one of utter libertarian and welfare disaster. The state can and currently does protect us from that. Inevitably, of course, immigration controls violate the property rights of those inside as well as outside who wish to exchange with each other who, and who can indeed maintain the costs of the immigrants' stay. Then sponsorship is one more libertarian way to deal with that. Inevitably, of course, having no immigration controls violate the property rights of those inside up to the point of national disaster. That is, a disaster for the people that comprise the actual nation, not a disaster for the state. The state may well grow stronger and become much more fearsome. Kaplan, 2012. Proponents of immigration restrictions have to show why, moral appearances notwithstanding, immigration restrictions are morally justified. As all arguments rest on assumptions and thereby amount to assumptions, there are no supporting justifications. It seems worth mentioning. However, <laughs> Immigration restrictions here appear to be more moral because they avoid a national disaster. Therefore, proponents of abolishing immigration restrictions have to show why, moral appearances notwithstanding, immigration restrictions are not morally defensible. Most Americans benefit from immigration and the losers don't lose much because the deluge of immigrants is not allowed. Immigration restrictions are not necessary to protect American culture or to protect American liberty unless the deluge occurs and then it will be too late. Even if all these empirical claims are wrong, though, immigration restrictions would remain morally impermissible. Why? Because there are cheaper and more humane solutions for each and every complaint. If immigrants hurt American workers, we can charge immigrants higher taxes or admission fees and use the revenue to compensate the losers. Presumably, any admission fees are payable at some time after entry, in which case the immigrants might be untraceable. Otherwise, they would be a form of immigration restriction. If 
immigrants burden American taxpayers, we can make immigrants ineligible for benefits. If immigrants hurt American culture, we can impose tests of English fluency and cultural literacy. Presumably, these tests of English fluency and cultural literacy must be at some time after entry, and probably not applying to Americans, <laughs> in which case the immigrants might well be untraceable. Otherwise, they would be a form of immigration restriction. If immigrants hurt American liberty, we can refuse to give them the right to vote. Whatever your complaint happens to be, immigration restrictions are a needlessly draconian remedy. All this simply overlooks the big picture. Assuming that there are no immigration restrictions, then all of these policies, libertarian and otherwise, would simply be swept away by the tide of incoming humanity. The same Gallup poll survey as cited earlier showed about 150 million foreigners had the US as their first preference for migration if only they were allowed. And even more would initially want to come to the US if the US alone opened its borders. However, the good news is they would only keep arriving until the US were no better, all things considered, than the places they were coming from. And that might well happen well before all of them were to arrive. Humour 2010 summarises its arguments in the conclusion. One, individuals have a prima facie right to immigrate, that is, a right not to be prevented from immigrating. On the contrary, in a libertarian world, people would need to be invited in by the property owners. So saying there is a prima facie right to come into a country sounds relevantly and sufficiently as mistaken as saying that people have a prima facie right to enter someone else's land or even house without being invited in. This is because a individuals have a prima facie right to be free from harmful coercion. Presumably harmful coercion to be consistent with libertarianism at least, can mean only something like proactive harm to one's person or libertarian property. If so, then agreed. B, immigration restrictions are harmful and coercive. But one is not proactively harmed by being denied access to benefits that other people own, however much one needs them and immigration controls are, by general intention at least, and however imperfectly, reactively coercive. Reactive coercion is defensive and thereby libertarian. The argument for free immigration ought to be persuasive to nearly everyone, regardless of ideological orientation. The argument ought not to be persuasive even to most libertarians and not to any welfare consequentialists either. Conclusion. There are three broad options on the issue of immigration. One, privatize everything along libertarian lines among the existing national citizens who would already own it all but for the state in any case. Then let liberty and free market sort things out. This is the only fully libertarian and economically efficient outcome. But it's not going to happen before most intellectuals become libertarians. 
so don't hold your breath. Two, open the borders and let unlimited numbers of people enter. This would be a libertarian and welfare disaster. But it is so obviously awful, except apparently to some well-known libertarians and the old German, <laughs> that it's never going to happen. So we don't have to worry about that. Three, having state controls on immigration. This is a highly, this is highly imperfect as regards liberty or welfare, but at least it avoids a national disaster. And it can slowly be moved in a libertarian direction. And that is what libertarians should be promoting. Specific, practical immigration policies that increase people's liberty and thereby also their welfare. Thank you. Any questions? Questions? Uh, Nick? Yeah, I mean, you won't, won't be surprised that I completely disagree with pretty much anything that you, you, you just said. It's, it's, yeah. it's all based on this premise that there is a disaster going on when immigrants come in. No! It, in, of course, it is your main thesis. No. Is if we open the borders now, there will be an utter disaster because all these people are coming in. It will be complete chaos and... Tens and, of millions. Huh? If tens yeah, tens of millions, whatever. It, 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 yeah. it is based on the idea that what we have right now will yeah. cause a chaos if we open the borders. Yeah. Which, there's absolutely zero evidence for any of this. It's just, it, I, I get this all the time in all these right-wing uh, 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 nationalist blogs. Yeah. They all assume it's going to be a disaster. I get, being from Germany, I yeah. constantly hear that Germany is now a, a hellhole in which everyone get, get, get raped by immigrants. The mm. fact is, crime is down in Germany in the last couple, couple of years. Uh, and, but they, they don't care about this because they, they, they have this emotional bias against Im immigrants. Yeah. So your, your, your premise is completely wrong. Well, I don't have this that bias. There will be this, this, this disaster. I don't have a bias against immigrants, and I'm not against uh, immigration as such. I just think if you have tens of millions very quickly, that is going to be a disaster. That, uh, 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 I'm not saying we shouldn't have immigration or all immigration by any means. No, of course you've got to have immigration. That's fine. But just not open borders. S some, some policies which clearly are libertarian, uh, 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 some are more libertarian than others. None of them are perfect. So I'm not uh, anti -immig I'm not saying everything that's happened so far is a disaster by any means. I'm saying the real scenario, if the Gallup poll is to be believed, and these people aren't lying, is they would come and yeah, maybe a hundred million would come. Would it alter yeah, this country yeah. much if a hundred million people who couldn't speak the language turned up? Well, they wouldn't turn up all at once. They want to It'd take come. a few months. No, or maybe no, no, a no. year. No, 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 that's, that's just, just not the evidence that we have from, from, from the historic movement. What happens is, a whole bunch comes first and, and prepares the ground for the next wave. And the, and the next waves are coming in the, in, in the next decades. I agree with you, there would be tens of millions coming to Europe if we open, open the borders, but not in, in a few months, because they themselves couldn't organize that much. There wouldn't be enough transport for these people to bring them in. Well, they, they don't. I mean, one lot is not going to say, well, you go ahead and in 10 years you tell me. I mean, some people might, with relatives, say something like that. Is, is that mine, Pat? No, okay. <laughs> with relatives might say something like that. Uh, but, I mean, anybody else who's in a terrible situation is just going to head straight here. Now, some of them virtually walk all the way. Some of them will be able to afford planes. Some of them will do deals whereby they agree to work if they get flown over. But um, I just don't see any limit on how f many and how quickly I mean it's well, going to be a hell of a lot a very most, very quickly most accommodation is in private hands so 
so at some point they would just face the fact that they couldn't uh, oh no 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 that's why i said oh, they, they just walk into uh, the parks and and all the parks would turn into shanty towns no i don't, I don't. What, what would stop them huh? what would stop the police wouldn't be able to stop them because no, there would be they, if there would be so would. many of them that the police no, couldn't no, possibly but the market would they wouldn't they wouldn't even show up if they don't have a place to stay because if borders are open you can organize these things and they would organize well there are people in london who don't have a place to stay already they don't leave you sleep where you can you you sleep in a doorway. But, but these are not these are not normal people. These are, those are people who are often uh, have have mental illnesses. Most homeless people have have, have mental illnesses like schizophrenia, for example. But they they may well be coming from countries where they have virtually nothing except a war. So this couldn't possibly well, be if worse. They, if they're fleeing a war, then then you can you can uh, push them back in, into a situation where they where their lives is in danger. Mm. That's 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 that wouldn't be libertarian. Uh, well, I, that's like, why this is where we've got. But if they if they're not we can have libertarian war, policies. If they're not fleeing a war, they yeah. would organise their trip like anyone else before they before they uh, uh, go on that trip. Well, they, they don't organise a, 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 a plane ticket. They organise a place to stay. If they don't, they can organise these things. They wouldn't. Come. I, I just think that's naive. You're, if if, you're, if 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 the gates are open, you get in quick because you think I don't know how long this is going to last. Uh, well, we know, as I that's said, there are tens right of now, millions. There, there are tens of millions yeah. of people uh, yeah. who want to come. Absolutely. Right. Uh, do you think that that? I mean, over what period of time do you think those people would come? You think they're going to come over ten years, twenty years? Ten, twenty years, yeah. Uh, well, the problem is, if we do the experiment, and you're wrong, that will, I mean, the country will be destroyed. I think people will leave and, uh, uh, you know, it's going to be a uh, How will it be destroyed? Just oh, the because there'll be so much uh, crime, breakdown in law and order, disease and whatever, that it will be as bad as the countries that they're coming from, because that's why they came here. They're, they're, They'll keep on coming until they've heard, until the grapevine tells them this country is as bad as their country, except it's cold and wet. No, they In which case, then they might stop. No, no, they're coming here because of, of, of bad governments, and they don't take these bad governments with them. They're, they're, they're people who want to improve their lives, they're, they're willing to, to work, work for that. Yeah. They come here to improve their lives. And if they don't yeah. improve their lives, they really end up in a cell, then they go back because mm. then they're at least they're the place that they know. Mm. So I, I don't see any evidence for this for this scenario that if you let people in, it will be this huge collapse of society and, 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 and chaos. There's, there's oh, just just, but just because of the volume of just the volume of people would mean law and order would be you couldn't be maintained. No, because markets would organize these these um, Markets would organize them. Well, they would let them in. If they bought a ticket to fly, or they bought a ticket to come over on the ferry or the train or Europe, whatever, uh, it would just, it, let, it wouldn't organise them beyond that. A lot of people, I think, who 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 came to this country didn't know what they were going to do when they arrived. They just assumed that they would find somewhere to live and they would get some kind of a job. And it wasn't all arranged. It wasn't all arranged in advance. And most people did. I mean, I I went around Europe and. Um, I had no idea when I was going to stay. I just assumed, well, I'd find somewhere, uh, you know, I'd book a hotel or whatever. And no, often I'd end up uh, sleeping on the train or something because there were, you know, it's you, you, you. Yeah, but if, if you, you don't get anywhere, do. you go, you, you go back. That's 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 what people do. Well, people you only go back. back. You only go back if uh, if uh, this country is worse than the place that you've come from. And no, uh, and in, in the case of Africa, for instance, a lot of people would say. I'm not going back to Africa, thank you very much. I'll stay here. Can we, can we stop having a dialogue? No, 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 and then Richard. Yeah, I've got, I've, got, yeah I've got a question. I was going to say to Nico, we, we know that markets just simply won't organise it all because they're not organising it all in Somalia or all Syria at the moment. Like, there's no market organisation there. If they all moved here, there won't be any market organisation here either. But the, uh, uh, the, the point I was going to make 
is that um, I, I used to be a naive believer in uh, open borders for the libertarian reasons often cited by uh, Block and Kaplan and so on. Uh, so did I. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so I first, first yeah. the, what first caused me to realise that this uh, was probably not all it was practically a false. So, uh, an anecdote Brian Micklethwaite told me. He said, well, this is, and it, it was told to him by somebody else. He pointed out, well, I've just been listening and you, you've been arguing that you should have totally free uh, access to guns. Anybody can own any guns they like. And there should be absolutely no uh, border controls at all. What's to stop the Soviet army just walking straight in? Or indeed, anybody else's army. You've got free movement and free gun control. It's just have to be free in population. It can be hostile states just walking in. Mm. Nothing stops it. Uh, so the, the, there must be something wrong with that scenario. Uh, oh, but what I would say about your argument, though, on this project, mm. uh, so I've been looking for something that Libertarian League says, yeah, you're, I think you're right, there is a disaster looming. If you just abandon all the border controls and let anybody who can want to come, mm. it would be a disaster. But what is there in the Britannic theory to say this? And I don't think Hopper's is about the only one. I think there's a few others, but he's the main one who's come up with some sort of attempt at an argument. And look, of course, it partly is Hopper, just because it's Hopper yeah. saying it doesn't mean it's not true. And yeah. nearly everything Hopper says is absolutely, it's just a, a non sequitur. One thing leads on from another and makes, it, makes no sense. Uh, and this is a better effort, I think, but I think it hinges on the idea it has to be a disaster scenario. Because if, well, if I'm the only because I think yeah. it is. If the disaster yeah. scenario isn't there, you then end up, you then end, you then end up saying, well, yeah, let's let the government manage it in the meantime, or let's let the government manage an industrial strategy in the meantime, and let's let mm. the government manage this. And you end up letting the government manage everything in the meantime, and mm. the meantime becomes in perpetuity, and you never get away from it. So there has to be there has to be some sort of radical break from letting the government manage it in the meantime. Mm. There has to be something that says why we're letting the government manage it in the meantime. Well, you say is there anything break, more than yeah. just it being a total disaster if we don't? Well, you're saying radical break, but I said you can have specific policies that are moving in a libertarian direction. Like, you can say, well, okay, if anybody wants to sponsor and guarantee anybody, fine. That, that's allowed. Uh, uh, it, uh, it's, we're, anybody who's genuinely fleeing uh, from a war, I mean, these people can come in because they're not going to be that many all the time. But, um, we can move in the right direction without saying we have to flip from government control to gov no control, which is never going to happen anyway. But we we might be able to persuade uh, all you know good think good hearted people that some policies are better than what we have at the moment. And so I think there's there's possibility of progress, but on. Uh, I mean, Hoppe's idea that it just is the sort of managing, sort of a state manager, the state is sort of managing on behalf of the, of the people, is, I think that's more or less right. But I give the counterfactual argument, which is we would have owned all this already if the state hadn't stopped us. Uh, Similarly, you know, the road outside my house, if the state hadn't taken it, then that would be owned by all the people who live in all of the houses. So the idea that it can just arbitrarily be given to somebody else seems to me uh, that would be a real nuisance to everybody in the road if it was uh, anybody can come and take it. Mind you, that's Block's position because he his position is uh, homesteading the government owns nothing, anything can be homesteaded, so there'd, so there'd be a sort of land rush, as it were, and if people can get into Richmond Park uh, first, even if then the, 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 oh, oh. the plane can land in Richmond Park, and all of the Muslims, say, can run out and sort of start with their shovels, digging up the land, yeah. so, right, we own it now, uh, but I, I think well, it's, could, it's just sort of crazy. You could, you could homestead, you could rush into an NHS hospital and homestead the kidney machine for some of the scrubs. Yes, yeah. Which is also so, now. Uh, I, I just think there are, there are more and less libertarian solutions, and I don't think that is a more libertarian solution. Uh, uh, it, it, it is an application of uh, property rights being absolute, and the only way to acquire them being 
uh, by mingling your labour. But then uh, it doesn't seem to fit our intuitions as to what would be actually fit liberty a bit better. As I said, the counterfactual, Every, people would have owned it. So give it to the people who would have owned it uh, and let them then carry on maintaining it, whatever it is. If there are genuinely uh, problematic areas, then we'll, you know, we can work something out or we can just give everybody a share and somebody will buy the shares if he thinks he's got a way of running it, whatever it is. Richard? Uh, yeah, I, I believe since the uh, 1950s and probably before, um, the vast majority of the general public have been very anti um, third world immigration of any mm. significant scale. Um, so, why do you think the political elites have overruled this viewpoint? It doesn't make sense from the um, median voter theorem. So, from a democratic perspective, you're trying to you know, grab sort of semi by votes. It doesn't really make sense from an economic perspective because, of course, the mm. um, third world, um, particularly the refugee populations, have got an appalling employment rates and huge welfare dependency. So I think with Somalis who arrived in the late 90s, they have something like 80% like unemployment, I think, um, and 99% uh, in receipt of housing benefit. So how do you explain this, right. the political elites? Well, I mean, uh, it, most of this, I mean, immigration was quite well restricted until Blair. And I think Blair, as far as I can see from what I've read, uh, deliberately made it easy because he knows these people are going to be Labour voters. Uh, there's the uh, motivation from the point of view of uh, pleasing your customers. But of course, um, what they call representative democracy is just a way of helping to legitimise the elected oligarchy. They've no intention of giving people whatever they want. They just want to do enough to maintain their legitimacy in order to rule and when they're ruling they're then going to do whatever they think is good and not necessarily good for the existing population but whatever they approve of because um, the, the elected oligarchs are you know perceive themselves as knowing better than everybody else now uh, I don't say that because I think democracy would be better while somebody like uh, Brendan O'Neill would say, no, democracy, that's the thing. I think democracy, if we had really had democracy, it would probably be even worse. So I'm not defending that, but there's a <laughs> clear... Saudi Arabia. <laughs> yeah. well, well, in some countries it would be better. Uh, <laughs> no, but it, it depends. Well, yeah, it, it depends what they vote for. I mean, are they going to vote for somebody to be killed arbitrarily? Yeah. Um, yes, sometimes. <laughs> or will they vote to get... Or will they vote to... Uh, for some more liberal things, and maybe they would. I don't really care well, because really because right. democracy is an illegitimate way of ruling people anyway, uh, by virtue of the fact that it's a way of ruling people, and they shouldn't you shouldn't rule people. So uh, there's a very real uh, sense in which it pays, uh, and I think the same is true in America. The Democrats know that every immigrant is a Democrat voter, pretty much, more you know. That's, and that eventually means it's uh, not that the Democrats are going to be um, eventually elected and only elected forever, but it's going to have to move yeah, yeah. the Overton window of what's acceptable into that direction yeah. of much more state intervention. And the people that now call themselves Republicans uh, uh, will look like Democrats in a uh, not very long period of time if that continues to happen. Anyone else? Paul? Is there anyone before Paul? No? Paul? Uh, yeah, in, in the, in the, uh, the chain of the, why immigration happened in this country anyway, I mean, initially, the, it was Commonwealth immigration, which was thought to be a continuation of the burden of empire. We, yeah. The empire, we've been ruining these people from apart, the empire's dissolving, and so there was a thought that they, they should be yeah. allowed to come and live in the country as well, as the, I think there's a need for labour post-war as well. Yeah. And even that was highly controversial. With, uh, after the certain people got in, you know, Enoch Powell uh, 
the, the whole power light movement arise. And that was, they, those numbers of people were tiny compared to what we've had recently. So, yeah. after, so there was the initial Commonwealth uh, influx of people. Yeah. Then the, the Ugandans, uh, the Idi then, then it started to become a sort of a more asylum type of thing. So when uh, Idi Amin threw the uh, uh, Asians out of Uganda, which is where Yasmin al Brown came from, um, and the others, they moved in. Uh, some of, there's been some, and even for, for these people, there's been somewhat assimilation. But then there has been, yeah, you say there's no disaster, but then there's been a lot of fallout of crime. At the moment, London is in a plague and the whole country is in a plague of black people, shoot, black children shooting each other. These are all the descendants of the original Commonwealth immigrants. Mm. There was the, the massive uh, Pakistani uh, paedophile uh, rape gangs yeah. operating in all these northern cities. This is all a result of that original Commonwealth immigration. So the same as well, no, same as no plus, disaster. Plus the fact that uh, for many of these crimes, even some of the more extreme ones, you get a, uh, you either get a slap on the wrist or you get free board and lodging for a few years with yes. co central heating, films, <laughs> conjugal visits. Uh, and well, I heard um, a woman uh, sociologist on the radio the other day, must have been Woman's Hour, saying that uh, women are much more likely to get pregnant uh, while they're in prison than when they're not. <laughs> and the the uh, interviewer drugs? the interviewer was was a bit mystified, <laughs> and as was I. So she said, "Can you explain this?" And her, she gave a sociological explanation about well, they have a, had a hard life, and and they're very confused. And he's, you, you're saying, "Who are the men? Who are the men?" Of, are they the guards? Is it uh, is it conjugal visits? It, that didn't get mentioned. They, it was all well. They're deprived. They're deprived. They're confused. Just yeah, but the sperm's got to come from somewhere. No expert. But in the end, she came up with so much sociological waffle that the the uh, the the interview didn't dare ask the question. No, what I meant was how physically. Did it happen? But of course, if an oh, economist, if an economist had uh, approached this thing, uh, somebody with from the sort of Gary Becker school of sociology, uh, he would have said, you know, they're they're there, they're bored. If you, uh, you you're young and you don't hate children, you're a woman, and if you have a child now, you know it's going to be brought up in fairly good conditions in prison compared to maybe what it would be outside. Uh, there are perks in not having to have all the duties that you have if you're a prisoner and you can quite you know you're, but i had to reconstruct this explanation myself because the sociologist was never going to do it but that must be the sort yeah. of thing that was going on yeah, it is like 57 of course <laughs> uh the, yeah but, but uh, she wouldn't tell us the mechanism we never actually knew yeah. and if yeah. i could just elaborate the box, that, the box that we were talking about. But i was going to say this then the second wave of immigration happened after we joined the european union or the eec originally yeah which is all fine when it was west europe uh you've got you know, italy spain france germany countries of a relative level of success and liberty to ourselves that tended not to matter. It's when the Iron Curtain came down and immediately vast swathes of the former Soviet Empire, all a much lower living standard than us, were suddenly given free freedom of movement. Yeah. And there were, there were obvious lies going on saying, oh, well, you know, as soon as we're there'll be you know, vast underestimations of how many Poles or Romanians or Bulgarians and so on and so forth would come here. Mm -hmm. uh, enormous numbers uh, moved here. And then now, the, the, the third wave of the immigration seems to be, to be based entirely on political correctness. Angela Merkel just letting enormous numbers of refugees yeah. from war and foreign countries, wars that often, often Western foreign policy has started, yeah. like the absolute madness of David Cameron overthrowing uh, Colonel Gaddafi. I thought that was lunacy at the time. We can yeah. see what now, the total Mediterranean border there, the ships pouring across into Italy and for, you know, Italy's got... But, and it's right to say that, that a lot of these people were letting, so obviously Labour voters, but what they didn't foresee was that a lot of traditional Labour voters switched to being UKIP voters, yeah. which is what caused the Brexit result. And yeah. similarly in America, what caused the Trump election. So there is always a backlash of the, to the shallow political calculations. So that that mm. seems to me to be the way it's going. And the number of uh, immigrants pouring in now, it just, it, it's been driven by people who grew up in universities where they taught nothing but politically correct crap over 
implementing it now they're policy makers, it seems to me. Yes, and uh, I heard, there's somebody who's got an article out at the moment about, you know, why are, uh, it could be Edward Stringham, I, uh, I might have got that wrong, you know, uh, trying to explain the sort of left-wing policies of universities, but it's not really left-wing, it's statist. And I wrote a short article on the Orgean stables of academe, you know, saying, you know, if the state monopolises the university system and university and degree system, you can't, in this country, you can't call yourself a university unless the state says you can. You can't award a degree unless the state says you can. And then provides a lot of the funding. In America, it's very, very slightly looser, varies state with state, but you can award degrees um, from private universities and whatever. So there's, there's a bit of wiggle room there. Uh, that is going to make sure that these people, if, if the people who, I, uh, the analogy I use, it's like asking uh, priests what they think of the Pope is like asking the average academic what he thinks of the state. Uh, <laughs> obviously, obviously the Pope is wonderful and the state is wonderful. Uh, and how can anybody doubt it? But then, of course, people point to the academics and say, well, they're the experts and uh, they say we need the state to do all of these things. You can't argue with the experts, can you? So. Uh, uh, that's the problem. If, if, if I could make, you know, one change, uh, you know, modest change to this country, I'd say just get the state out of higher education completely and utterly. Have nothing to do with universities. You can't say, uh, oh, well, people won't learn to read and write, which is all rubbish anyway, as we know from the history of, uh, you know, E.G. West's books. Uh, but you can't say that by the time you're 18 years old, you you have to be subsidised. So just get the state out completely and watch how quickly all of these people in the private universities suddenly start understanding the market and suddenly understanding what private property has to do with freedom. Uh, it would be a, a, an intellectual revolution. But at the moment, they're effectively uh, bribed to come up with one statist policy after another, which is why when you watch something like Question Time or listen to any questions on the panel, you know you're going to hear the small Overton window of statist views and nothing else, nothing outside that. Very, very, very occasionally you'll get somebody uh, who calls themselves a libertarian. They won't be invited back. <laughs> Kate Anders on every now and again. <laughs> <laughs> He's waved his foot. He wants to go after you, Nico. Nico? Uh, yeah, I don't understand this whole argument. Like, look, we, we have seen this, this misery with, with immigration. We have now crime rates in, in, in London. So we have crime rates in London because the ordinary population is completely disarmed, and the police is a monopoly that has absolutely no interest in fighting you're, crime. You're saying we have, we have crime rates because the population is disarmed? Yes. Well, uh, this is... So, uh, my, my, my point being, why point out mm. that the problem is too much freedom? The problem is that, that we let people in and, and don't put, put uh, state barriers on it. Why not argue the problem is too little freedom, that too many things are monopolized, that, that mm. the uh, population effectively has, has no means to defend themselves against criminals? Yes, well, I don't think guns uh, are the right answer. Like, uh, um, and it's something that... Uh, American libertarians in particular, but not only American libertarians, have this idea that, well, if everybody carried a gun and so forth, uh, I can't imagine almost nothing worse than instead of carrying knives, all of these young hoodlums have now got guns. Uh, if you've got a chance of running away from a knife, or maybe the knife won't kill you, but if once they start shooting you, uh, that, uh, that you're much more imperiled. But what would be the libertarian solution? There would be all private streets. If all the streets were private, you would then have to decide what rules are we going to have in our streets. The street I live in, and I think I'm not unusual, I would say no guns, no prostitutes, 
no drugs, thank you very much. I mean, these things can exist in other streets where they are allowed and they and people are welcome to go there and and uh, and do what they like insofar as those rules exist. But I think the average person would say, I would like to live in a safe street. Uh, and therefore, even though um, it's slightly problematic because it relies on a counterfactual, uh, the best we can do is to say, what would the market have done? And therefore, it would be better if the state did do it. And that is to control guns. I mean, if, if you could just go into any shop and buy a gun, that would be a sound <laughs> that you would hear now. And every one of those bangs would be a dead body and it would be on your conscience. <laughs> that's, that's not, I would certainly like to live in a street with guns and I grew up in a street with guns. But then you can if they're private streets. Uh, yeah, most people would. I mean, if you, if you most people only would. In town, most that people guns, would. Who would I, like to live in a street? Most people would. Yeah. Put your hand up if you'd like to live in a street where everybody has guns. <laughs> One, two, three, four. We're libertarians. I, I, I used to have guns. Yeah, <laughs> where, where everybody can just buy one. Well, given that we're libertarians, that's not, you know, that's not really a convincing. Uh, uh, show of people well, in favour. Don't stop in the street. That's the thing. Then you can go into the next territory, which yeah. may not have the same policy. Well, so but of course, yeah, if you have private gates, policy, and will be then, uh, it is armed. I mean, in, in a world with guns, what well, is highly problematic uh, once the st once the state owns the streets. It's highly problematic as as regards what's the more libertarian thing to do or the most libertarian things to do. Uh, exactly. And, you, can, and, and you, you ultimately you have to say, well, you've got to privatise the damn streets and then let, let the owners decide. Yes, that's And that is the only real way. However, some things are slightly more libertarian than others. And when I see people killing each other, killing each other with, gu with, with knives, and I think if they didn't have knives and they had guns, would London be safer? I well, don't think so. Quite I quite think quite if, quite well, quite it, quite we don't seem to see such wonderful safety in America, even though a lot of people are allowed to carry guns. They're still but that terrible. That's not the reasons. That's not the reason. That, that has other <laughs> reasons than the guns. It, it wouldn't be safer without the guns. The reason we don't have guns in this no, country is because of the Second no, World War, First World War, the revolutions. That they had the returning armies. Yeah. Not disarmed. Mm. Well, I mean, no, the, the real reason why we haven't had guns is because from 1800 to 1850, we voluntarily disarmed ourselves. When I went to America, I never seen a single gun. I never even seen a, a, a well, I didn't see a single cop, enough. Yeah, you have to, have to keep it hidden. But anyway, uh, some, you know, uh, no, it's you and then it's, it's you. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I'll, I'll just, just pick up this argument about guns. Um, I mean, you mentioned about uh, people having guns. You know, as long as the, you, the police are disarmed, there's no reason why the population should, should even want to buy guns, really, as long as the police are. But now we have an armed police force, generally, only one in five police officers in the Met are armed. Most, most of them are hidden. Uh, their guns are hidden. The problem is, if, you, if you're in a situation where you're dealing a life or death situation with a <laughs> with a police officer, you don't know if he's got a gun or not. It's hidden. If you, you might have to shoot him. <laughs> he's going to shoot you. Uh, that's the problem. As long as you haven't, as long as you, as long as you haven't got a state, effectively it's an army. When, once you arm a police force, it's no longer a police force. It's an army. In the United States, they don't have a police force. It says police on the cars, on the, on the armed cars, but but it's not a police. It, it, it's an armed militia. It's an army. So there's nothing wrong with a civilian force in, in, in people in, in the states. Be an army, mm. you know, because you have an army on the street. It's it, it's pretty much like that here now. But you, you don't know if the police are armed or not. You, you can see them sometimes in outside Parliament. They're carrying up automatic, big automatic weapons. But other, otherwise, they might appear just like the or Dixon of Doc Green, like the village Bobby. But he, he could have an automatic weapon under his jacket. So you know, you, you just don't know. So there's a case of armed, letting the civilian population here be armed. Because it's not just what you see on the street. You mentioned about guns firing. 
people down. There's also a psychological factor as well. People are fearful of the state, and you yeah. know they, they vote in certain ways and they act in certain ways. And you, you need, you know, libertarianism is based on a culture and a culture of free expression. When you have a, an army, even like the the the, 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 the hidden so, so, hidden gun army that we have on the streets now, uh, you know, pe people are subdued. They're afraid to do things, and, and they, they 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 live in, in a kind of in a sheepish world. You know, kind of uh, well, scaredy cat town. They will never admit it. They'll I've never, never I've never you. been fearful that a policeman was going to shoot me. And I saw some policemen with machine guns standing outside New, well, Scot I, I, New Scotland Yard. And I, yeah, well, I never thought it never occurred to me well, well, they might just, shoot me. Yeah, that's but just, that's just a when I see some people, some you know, gangs in the street, yeah. um, if I thought they had a gun and they started waving a gun around. But then, I would be running away from them. But if they thought that you had one, then they probably wouldn't do that. Use and if I can uh, just pick up on that, I have, <laughs> I, I've, I've, had, I've had armed police in, in my own courtyard. You can't outshoot, one person can't outshoot yeah, a gang where effect, they've all got guns. Effectively threatened, effectively, yeah. not literally, effectively threatened to shoot me because I was going to take a picture of them yes. in my own private courtyard. Yeah. You know, and they put that camera away. And they had guns, I mean, I would say, not, not, not pointing at me, but pointing in my direction towards the floor. Yeah. Put that camera away, put that camera away. You want me to take a picture of them? Mm. I mean, uh, so that was, I also have experiences in, in Germany as well, where you have armies on the streets there. Um, so it, I, I know that, how, you know, the, the effect that has on the population. Um, but but um, that was, uh, I think, you know, as long as you, once you arm the police, which effectively what we've done here, then we should have the right to be armed. Because if the police, uh, if you really rely on the police to protect us, I mean, the, the, the assistant commissioner, mm -hmm. I believe that was his title, uh, second in command of the Met, mm -hmm. locked himself in a car recently so that, you know, the, the, the boogeyman would not get, get him when his yes. fellow officer was being yeah. uh, ripped to pieces but by a, a, a lunatic with a knife. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he's got a lot of excuses for doing that. I, I can't understand any of them. But uh, if, if you've got people like that, and he's the second in command in the Met, mm. um, he, 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 he claimed that he didn't have any weaponry on him. No, he didn't. He was told to get back in the car by our police who arrived. And they were armed. They said, you're not armed. Not, not, where I where I read. Read. not where I live. He oh, said, I, he said I, I, I didn't have any weaponry on me, mm. so I thought it was safer uh, to, to lock, lock the uh, car. And that was it. But then again, if you look at it, uh, it's actually a, a criminal offence if, if, if a policeman, if a police officer needs assistance and, and requests it, and requesting can be a scream or a cry for help, which is what this guy did. He didn't say, I need help, but he, he was screaming. Not to help him is a criminal offence. So I don't know why that guy wasn't arrested. Because even he was told by a fellow policeman to get back in the car. He was in the way. Well, that actually, policeman, is it? Well, he wasn't in the way. Was he? He, yes, wasn't he was in the way. He was, he was out of the way. That's why he stayed where he was and he got the car. But anyway, uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't to dwell too much on that, but, but the fact is that if you've got the, the police are not going to protect you, don't think that they are. They, you know, they, 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 so well, this is getting a bit off topic though, well, well, we're supposed to be talking about immigration. We do need an armed, uh, we do need an armed yeah, well, police officer. Yes, just yeah. to come down to the immigration debate again, mm. I, just want, I just want to pick up on something. Um, the, the, need for, the need for strong border controls, whatever they are, mm. states or libertarian, you know, libertarian ideas, but a, a strong border control. Um, a few years ago, I don't know if anyone remembers this, I'm an avid newspaper reader, and they always go through a lot every day. Um, there was a man who came from, I can't remember, the third world country. Uh, he was facing deportation, and he murdered a woman, he stabbed her to death, for one reason only, so he could spend the rest of his life in a British prison, rather than to be deported. He said, well, it's better to, to spend my, my life in a British prison than, you know, to, uh, mm. face hunger every day. And that's exactly what happened. I don't know if you remember that. It was about uh, two or three years ago. Um, uh, just, just to nickel that these are the. It's not just the old person you'd be dealing with. That. You would be dealing with thousands upon thousands of people like that if you had open yeah, but borders. What, what, why do you import him? Let him here. Let him live a good life here. What's, what's the point? Well, whatever, whatever your system you're going to have, you're still going to have some method of deportation, even if he commits a crime in your libertarian world. 
presumably you're there's going to be somewhere down the long list of your rules where you can be taken to somewhere else, which he doesn't the want to be taken club, to. Maybe, or, or, or some camp where you can work off your, your, your debt or whatever, but, but not... If, if someone commits a crime, put him, in, put him in front of the court. That's what you do with people. You don't have to send them back. Well, what, what's, what good does that do? Well, it saves, saves uh, uh, an awful lot of taxpayers' money if you, you do, you because it co it's, it's cheaper to send a boy to Eton than it is to keep a prisoner in prison, so... You also have that to, doesn't if, solve if, the if problem, these, then he commits crime abroad. If these people are going to face justice, you also need to keep tags on them, surveillance. Now, the government loves surveillance, and if, okay, they, they, they can bring immigrants. Immigrants cause trouble, and that would give the state, as, as what happens every day, the perfect excuse for mass surveillance. They say, yes, well, we have to keep tabs on you. We have to have a satellite. Look, you know, or you have to get, sorry, we have to, you have to buy a TV license so we've got your name and address. Then we can see if you're watching, we can see if you're watching RT or some Arabic channels or whatever. So we know exactly what you're watching on TV. We've got your name and address and we can keep tabs on you because you might be a terrorist. Of course, that's complete nonsense. But this is the kind of things that happen. And, and yeah, the government right loves that. I mean, even the, even the police uh, bringing huge numbers of people, uh, uh, foreign criminals, to act as informers, police, you know, the police informers with this, with this lunatic drug, this whole drug nonsense, which, you know, the, 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 the government keeps spinning out of control, saying, oh, we have to control you, but, you know, we have to control you because of, you, you might take drugs or whatever. I mean, uh, these are the kind of things that go on all the time. There was a, uh, well, I, I, I won't go into details, but I, I could give you examples. But, you know, you also have a problem of changing technology as well. When the NHS was set up, it was set up for everybody. It was for, for everyone. And that, that was, if you, if you read the bits and pieces on there, that seems wonderful. Nothing wrong with that. The problem is that they, they didn't have cheap air travel at that time. Nowadays, you've got people flying in from everywhere just to use the NHS yeah, that's the and, f and fly back. So as technology changes... That's the problem with it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that's just one of the problems with it. But it's, I mean, it's technology... It was never envisaged that, you know, it would no, be... No, of course not. Socialism be, wasn't supposed to be great, but it's never no, no, it was never envisaged that technology would change to such a level no. that the NHS would be available to anybody to fly here. It was envisaged that it wasn't costing, that it would be impossible to cost. The arguments. Just like the arguments prior to uh, the referendum in 2016, there's been no new arguments since 2016 on Project Fear. Uh, and likewise, there have been no new economic arguments on the NHS. They are all, you, you go back in 1948, you'll find a lot of them. Uh, they, it wasn't costed. And, uh, and you know, there's a, there you are, I shouldn't speak too much. Richard. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you are. Yeah, 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 and, uh, um, one of my uh, many weird hobbies is to read um, studies in anthropology. Yes. I came across the, probably one of the most racist societies in the world are the uh, pygmies of the Congo, who regard their um, sort of normal sized neighbours as uh, black savages because they're of a slightly darker skin tone. And that's how they actually refer to them in their own languages mm. as black savages. And of course, uh, black on black racism is horrendous in many parts of Africa, like the Ivory Coast against Burkinabis, for example, mm. Nigeria against the Togolese and uh, people from the Bay. What about the yeah. Japanese against the Koreans? Well, quite exactly. <laughs> yeah. so, and the, and the Chinese. So then, looking, yeah. looking back to uh, uh, Sean Gap's talk, I think it was earlier yeah. this year about the um, importance of tradition. But how would you explain how this sort of distrust of outsiders and uh, even going as far as racism? seems to be common to virtually every society in the world. Yeah. How is distrust of outsiders? Yeah, I mean, is there some sort of evolutionary reason for it or an economic reason? Why is it... Why well, is I, mean, there, there, I mean, I would probably... Uh, there is a, um, what used to be called sociobiology and now is uh, evolutionary psychology, I think. It is, uh, people tend to have a preference for people who are like themselves because they're more likely to be genetically related to them, and against people who are less like themselves. And if they're sufficiently unlike themselves, even eat them if they're probably not if they're people, but if they're animals, because they're so far. But eat, but certainly people as well. I mean, before slavery, 
almost every society seems to have had cannibalism. There are, they discover in virtually every country that you go into uh, old enough uh, bones, fossilized bones, which show signs that these, they were ha they're human bones, they were cut, these people had to have been eaten. That's the only way these cuts along the bone could have happened. So uh, there is a natural tendency for people to be predisposed towards people who are more like themselves, but this needn't be any trouble at all because as long as you have a free market, we can all rub along without any problem at all. It's only once you uh, decide to invade uh, somebody else's territory, which is going to be bad economics in the long run. So, I mean, it's always, you're always going to get more out of them by trading with them than you are by invading them. Even in the United States, when they probably took over the whole country and became the richest country in the world. Um, yeah, it wasn't necessary. It wasn't necessary to kill the uh, uh, what they ridiculously call Native Americans, because <laughs> anybody who was born in America is a Native American. They must mean Aboriginal, but I think the very word Aboriginal is, is according to political correctness, now probably um, you're not allowed to say it. Uh, it's, it's politically correct speak. It mustn't say Aboriginal. You could say autochthonous. Uh, which is that's a bit of a mouthful. Uh, yeah, they could have. They could have done legitimate mi deals with all of the um, Aboriginal population and stuck to them and solved their problem. In the same way, Israel could have done legitimate deals with everybody, bought them out. And if they had done that, uh, Israel would be completely legitimate. And America would be completely legitimate. I mean, America is, the US is, um, I mean, it's too long ago now, to, I think, to give uh, uh, the so-called Indians compensation. But of course, they do get a hell of a lot by virtue of the fact that they're allowed to run uh, casinos uh, and drink themselves to death, you know. I would, I wouldn't. I would like the rights to run a casino in America. I'll be over there building another, um, another Las Vegas if I had that. Until the lobsters arrive. Hey, hey, you want to come back, Patrick? Yeah, yeah. No, no. Just come back on on on, on the need for uh, strong immigration policy, whatever they come from, from the state or from private or whatever. Um, just come back to what we were talking about. Um, the I mean, RT has been criticised a lot recently for showing propaganda and what have you, fake news and what have you. Mm. Um, obviously, we're, we're all against any kind of um, uh, any censorship here. Right? So I, I, I used to watch it, I had more time for a while, I used to watch it quite a lot, not so much perhaps I had a lot of time. But uh, one of the things they showed there was that the um, uh, uh, bombing, a uh, uh, very uh, uh, very good pictures, uh, definition, high definition pictures of some of the towns which were bombed out. Yeah. And uh, they were showing that. Uh, Sorry, where? In, in Syria. Yeah. In Syria. And you know we have a, we've had a lot, a lot of uh, refugees coming to Europe from Syria. Um, and one of the things that's always puzzled me about these pictures is knowing knowing the price of some of the bombs. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, how on earth could they could they offer such uh, um, could they be so effective? Because you had whole towns where literally every flat you saw in every tower block was burnt out and destroyed. I thought, well, hang on, that's impossible. Surely this well, is it's a hell of a lot of bombs. But <coughs> and they kept of, coming. A hell of a lot of refugees from the town because the whole the, 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 yeah. the whole population of the towns had actually come to Europe yeah. and many I dare say they ended up in the UK. Mm. And I suspected that either these pictures were fake. Or but perhaps there was some other reason behind it. Mm. And lo and behold, on one of the um, RT uh, uh, pictures there, the, the, the mayor of the town appeared. Mm. And he said, what have you done in the West? You idiots, what have you done? Mm. And uh, the, you know, the, it was all translated into the, it was in Russian. And he, the, 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 the um, chap the microphone said, well, what, what do you mean? It wasn't us that dropped the bombs. He said, no. He said, no. He said, the people of the town, they set fire to their own flats. 
so that they could themselves out they, and, and so they could become refugees and they all fled to the West. He said, they've all yeah. gotten the perfect excuse. They've got the perfect excuse, practically everyone in the town, to burn their flats out. Well, you don't need to. Away. You don't need Syria. to. You can go to the Syria rest and tell a lie. You don't need to destroy yeah. your home. You just yeah. leave. And but when you do it, yeah. when, when you do it in a multitude, yeah, that's when you get UN aid. Uh, you know, you, uh, uh, you've got all these uh, NGOs, these government agencies, get ferrying you mm. across the Mediterranean. Actually, you've got actually ferry ports. A lot of ones. Yeah. I don't know if you know that. Actually, <laughs> ferry on them uh, over to over to the Italy and. You know, a, a lot of them have got, the, got the perfect excuse to do that. They weren't actually bombed. In fact, you couldn't you couldn't bomb a lot of these towns the way that they've been. But you, you know, you, people will. Well, this this is this does happen. The people will move, and they need the slightest reason to do so. Um, you know, from from these. Uh, from Syria these was, same happened in Libya, obviously. Syria was quite a prosperous society with a long, uh, with a huge middle class. They weren't doing so no, bad. No, yeah. Absolutely. No, no, go, go, no. Guess anyone who go, who is not, in Syria. No. Syria is not a, 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 a completely rundown place with before climate, these Islamists no, moved in no. and they destroyed it. With of climate, they destroyed with, with, with climate change, they were suffering from a severe lack of water for a start. They could. They were having huge families, at which they, they could not support. They simply could not support themselves. They they, they were they were on a you it's know a on a, nonsense. Well, I mean, I mean, Prince Charles even commented on that. that uh, he says he, yeah. say, he says he says <laughs> that he says that all the refugee crisis in the Middle East was uh, were major cause was climate climate change. Yeah, and climate change is, is, is responsible for everything these days. Well, it, it, it's well, no one think he's <laughs> I, I blame him for climate change. <laughs> Do you want to come back on that? No, no it's sort that's of that's getting off topic. Uh, yeah. Paul, Paul? Yeah. Um, you have said that you're not uh, okay. totally against immigration. I think there can be some quite happily, and some of it's useful, but you want the government to manage it in the interim. Well, uh, it, I it has to. Yeah, it has to. Yeah, sorry. Just give you a steer on what kind of answer. Right. <laughs> the government should manage it in the interim. Uh, but I don't think you elaborated on what principles you think the government ought to be following in this managerial. So what are the managerial principles the government ought to be... Yeah, so we, we let in you know, intellectuals or from various countries or in sort of... Uh, Visa systems or skills or you know, yeah. What are the principles that this managerial, managerialism built follow? Well, the, the, the short and simple <laughs> answer is the policies that they should follow should be as libertarian as possible. Uh, and the long and complicated answer. Uh, it's impossible to give because the, you're arguing about the detail. The thing is, probably we pretty much agree that if you privatised everything and then just leave people alone, we don't have a problem. Given the state, in effect, owns and controls so much, it clearly can do things which are more libertarian or less libertarian but then it becomes extremely difficult to work out what is more libertarian and what is less. And maybe something is more libertarian in the short run, but it leads to worse long run consequences or whatever. So, uh, but this is, a, it, what I normally say is this, the best thing to do is simply always argue for private property anarchy is giving people more liberty and try not to get drawn into uh, arguments about what the state should do or shouldn't do because it's sort of, you're missing out an opportunity to explain the right answer to them by explaining, trying to explain an imperfect answer and you might be wrong anyway. Uh, I had another thought. Well, so I'd like to provoke another thought. Yeah. Uh, which is that that's fine, and I don't. Uh, uh, I, I think that's correct in principle, but I don't. I think what we can't shy away from mm. is criticising existing government policy. So the government comes yeah. up to us with a policy and says we're going to do this, 
as libertarians, do we say, well, we well, approve of this armed balance, or we don't approve of yeah. this armed balance? So government, current immigration policy that the government has had in this country, is it good enough? Is it poor? Would you criticise it? Do you think they've let too many in? Not enough in? What would you say about it? Well, first of all, you've got to paint a picture of what would the libertarian policy, what would a libertarian world be? Everybody owns everything already, and then they decide who's going to come in and who's not going to come in. How that then translates into what migration policy should be allowed is, is really difficult. I mean, it's, it's such a mess. If, you, if, if there are no legitimate owners, uh, the government's so-called nationalised so much, it's, it's almost impossible to come up with the right answer, only in very, very broad strokes, so that when some libertarians say, open the borders and let anybody come in, to me that looks like, well, that can't be more libertarian. Uh, and there's room for debate on, say, gun control. I'm inclined to think that the more libertarian option is that the average thug can't just go into a shop and buy a gun. Probably. But the only real solution is going to have to be private property and then they, the owners decide. No guns allowed here or it's up to you. Any guns are allowed, no problem. Uh, and of course, once we see certain areas having strict gun controls and others not, we will then be able to see by the competition between them, as it were, virtual competition, in terms of which area actually is safer. It could be that the area with strict gun controls gets people coming in with guns and causing more damage. Or it might be that the area which says, no, anybody can have a, have a gun actually has quite high uh, death from gun crime. We can't really know. It's, it's, a, it's again, it's a market discovery procedure. And it's, uh, that is how we learn. We, we allow everybody else, everybody to make their own decision. We look at what they do and think, I'm definitely not trying that, or, oh, that might be worth a try. Without that market discovery procedure, it's extremely difficult to say, obviously, what the state ought to do is this, because it's more libertarian. It's not, it can't be obvious. Uh, uh, but sometimes you have to do it. Sometimes you have to do it. So, the fact that the uh, state, I think, doesn't um, have, uh, I, I read, or sorry, I heard on the radio the other day, um, about half of all burglars get a 200 pound pound fine when they're caught and convicted and I thought well that can't deter only when you're caught and, and only 200 pounds where's the deterrent there now I have a completely different theory of libertarian restitution and how you make it proportional to what they've done and whatever uh, uh, and what this the state has given us is is not a mess however uh, they're now so, we, well. This country has swung from uh, the possibly apocryphal. I don't know. You know, hanging a little boy for stealing a loaf of bread. Maybe there was a boy who stole a. I certainly they did hang people for <laughs> terribly <laughs> minor. <laughs> they, 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 crimes. Right. Them, they've <laughs> swung from from capital crimes for what we would regard as misdemeanors to to the complete opposite. And uh, uh, so, so free board and lodging for a few months for doing really awful things. Now, that we cannot be libertarian. But more than that, you really can't say. Because the idea that the state can get it right, it cannot get it right. It can do something really stupid in one direction or really stupid in the other direction and something which is probably completely inefficient in the middle but it's about the best 
you can ever hope that the state can do while the state is in charge. Uh, but these arguments are, as your question appeared to imply, they are inevitable. We, given that we we cannot just say, oh, it's okay, we'll have private property anarchy and then everything's fine. That's not the cards. We have to have an opinion on these things. But it's... Uh, it's uh, it can never be precise. It just, it's just it's ridiculous to think you can ever say this is the, except in very very rare, very specific cases. Uh, maybe something like marriage. I mean, um, you can say who should be allowed to get married. Well, if the state just wasn't involved. Uh, let anybody draw up any marriage contracts they like. This is what they always would have done. It's what they used to do before the state nationalised marriage. Um, and it's such a small move away from what we have now to say, well, just the state shouldn't control marriage, that you can probably advocate that and not be seen to be uh, unduly extreme. But if, if you say, well, the state has to control marriage, if the, and given that the state does control marriage, what should the rules on marriage be? Then you, you begin to start guessing. And uh, uh, it's very, very difficult to, 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 uh, to say this is the correct. This is the correct political libertarian policy because the, in a sense there can never be a correct political libertarian policy because the politics is incorrect. The very fact that it's a political decision is incorrect. It's anti-liberal anyway. Yes, it, it will be. Whatever whatever you come up with is going to be a liberal. Because it's political. Well, with that, uh, thank you very much indeed for attending Wait, the meeting. I have another question. Sorry? I have another question. Oh, yes, another question. Oh, 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 we just said we never spoke. Well, okay, then we'll extend the meeting. <laughs> we'll extend the meeting. Paul, to ask you two. Yes. Um, yeah, no, I, 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 uh, I partly agree with what you said there. Uh, it's very difficult to say. I you're partly, partly right. Part of the reason you think it's difficult to say is because you're a philosopher and you can't be bothered to do all the, uh, all the uh, empirical research that might be involved in coming up with, mm. coming up with an analysis, mm. which I think is fine. Mm. But even if you do do that, like the IEA do and the Adam Smith Institute do, and yeah. various think tanks do, who mm. try to shy away from too much philosophy, and mm. they want to put policy presentations from government. Yeah, they do. The, the trouble with that is that people start these, these should be seen as sort of transitional compromises on the way to liberty. But yes. Very often they're seen as no, this is the absolutely right answer. And people then start taking sides yeah. about what should just be. A, com a compromise, mm. then you then start generating further areas of division away from the main philosophical area of division. Yeah. And, and, and that's why uh, whenever we get into a sort of unavoidable argument about given that the state is going to do something, what is the more libertarian or the less libertarian, it's always worth pointing out the complete libertarian solution at the same time that you're pointing out. So that is the ideal, and that is a uh, lodestar for guiding our compromise. And even if we've made a mistake on our compromise, that's where we're trying to get. Uh, and if you tell people that, they, they can then criticize it in terms of that, but also you've given them uh, some sort of ideological uh, understanding of where you're coming from, rather than why have you just got this wacky opinion? You, you've actually given them an explanation of, of, of what you're aiming at and why you're aiming at it. Um, here endeth the lesson. <laughs> <laughs> I think we need a semi thing. No, no, we don't. You've set your now finished your fucking call. Sorry? I can come back again if you don't mind. Oh, go on then. Yeah. Well, I'll be. What I would say to that is that people thought they had the pristine libertarian position in mind, which is absolutely open borders. So they thought, you know, what Block and Kaplan and Callan thought they were doing and saying 
is saying, well, we don't want any of this compromise. What we want is absolute libertarianism and every compromise, absolute open borders, that's the libertarian position. Yeah. And every compromise on the way should be a step towards that stepping stone. And you're mm. completely reversing that yeah. and say, no, what we want is completely gated communities, total borders everywhere, complete managerial, you know, complete mm. private management of all territory. And the state should be moving towards that instead. Yeah. Is, that, is that what you're, is that the kind of shift you're trying to do? Uh, I suppose so. But also, because they might agree with that point but they wouldn't agree with this point which is I think you should give people the land that they would have owned had the state not taken it into its own ownership and uh, it's, privatization isn't enough because I don't think that it makes sense to say right there can be a land rush from around the entire world and anybody who gets here first uh, can uh, put in a claim. I give it to the people who have been paying their taxes all these years and who would have owned it anyway. And then they will, of course, then make economic decisions and invite plenty of people over here uh, to work for holidays, sell them the land, whatever. But there will be careful economic decisions which as far as possible because it's all within private property framework will not be a nuisance to other people no, well, that's what the whole thing falls apart because the control of this private land has to be centrally put into a register run by the government no otherwise there's no control over the borders of the land this is my this land no it's mine no. all the way over there no 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 yours that okay, so where yours is mine goes over there that's my we, Well, private law uh, is a way of getting around that, but that, that's another talk. Private law and how it works is another talk, but there are uh, some well-known books on this. What's the most well-known one on private law? The, the, enterprise, the, enterprise, enterprise, the enterprise of Law, Bruce Benson. Yes, but actually, you believe in no firearms. I believe in firearms. This is, this is a bad bit of land. You said it's your bit of land. I'm just going to shoot you. And there's no argument anymore. Because I've got the to say have a gun or not have a gun. You've chosen not to have a gun, I'll kill you. That's easy. Then you can't claim this piece of land as yours. Well, that's, that's the, yeah. Yeah. That's where you get <laughs> into a different talk. Yeah. You're talking about anarchy. That is getting into a that's getting into a different area. It's uh, so opening another can of worms. Yeah, no, no, uh, no, yeah. no, I think uh, that's safe. I think that's right. Uh, I think the meeting is ending. Thank you very much for doing for coming along. And uh, next. So I'm still, I still have sorted out whether Steve is talking, uh, Steve Berry is talking in December, or whether I am. Uh, Steve is going to be talking on uh, was the First World War necessary, I think. And um, uh, he, you know, he's, uh, he's picked up a book by... And do the Germans still owe us reparations? No, he, 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 he's, picked up, he's picked up a book by... Possibly uh, in terms of beer. He's picked up a book by a uh, conservative chap who doesn't like the Conservative Party. Uh, what's Scruton. his name? Uh, Roger Scruton. Uh, no, well, the uh, 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 yeah, yeah. 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 And he's, he's going to decide that. Uh, I, I'm going to talk on uh, uh, religion, uh, and um, my topic will be uh, is uh, Islam uh, a normal religion? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Steve was an mistake for us. Steve who? Steve Berry. <laughs> you never said his, oh, you never said his name. <laughs> <laughs> So it's officially ended. Yes. Right. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.